Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Law Path presentation. My name is Ryan Tan, and today we're going to be going through buying a business, how to successfully complete the sale. So we'll be joined by our expert legal counsel, in-house lawyer, Damon Murdoch, shortly. This is always a great webinar around this time of year with people buying and selling businesses. There's a lot to keep in mind uh, with things around contracts, transferring employment contracts, uh, revaluing stock. There's a lot of things to get in place. It's not just as simple as, say, taking a simple uh, business sale agreement from the platform. So Damon will do a comprehensive deep dive here into the asset sale versus share sale, doing things like your valuation, financial records, contracts, confidentiality, and then looking at things around the sale of assets, the proceeds and issues, shares, and then in trouble, uh, what are your legal remedies and rights to remedy the situation? So again, uh, any questions for Damon, please pop them in during the presentation. We will get to those right at the end. And we will have an exclusive webinar offer for everyone on today's presentation as well. Just a bit about LawPath. We've been in operation for over eight years now, serving over 400,000 Australian small businesses just like yours saving them over $100 million in legal fees and garnering over 10,000 five-star reviews in the process. So just getting started, helping small businesses access online on-demand legal help in a simple and easy fashion. So again, I'll pass it over to Damon to kick off the presentation today. Hello, everybody. I'm just turning on my video. All right, very good. Welcome, everybody. I hope uh, you're having a good day. Today, we're talking about the sale or purchase of a business. Um, and there are different ways to do it. So what we'll try to do is talk about main, the main two ways on how you would do it, and then the pros and cons of each. If you have any questions, please put those questions in the Q&A section, and we'll go over the Q&As at the end. And we'll probably be able to get to every different question that you want to ask. Now, there is a difference between an asset sale versus a share sale. So to give you an example, if you were to sell your business, so maybe you're a sole trader and you want to start up a company, so you might sell all the assets in your business from your sole trader, ABN, over into a new PTY LTD company. Or it might be that someone's interested in buying your business, but they don't know whether you've actually paid your tax for the last five years. So instead, they will buy the assets of your business as a going concern. So that would be your, your technology, your domain name, your trademarks, everything. Um, but they leave the company behind and they take all the assets, they pick them all up, and move them into a brand new company. And then the other way to do it is to buy the shares. So you might have a PTY LTD company, you sell 100% of your shares over to somebody else, that's it. So let's talk about the difference between the two. So when you're buying assets, you're gonna be buying the plant, the equipment, the business name, the license, the permits, uh, goodwill, all these customer lists and so on. Now, that sounds like it's quite easy and simple, but there's a lot of issues when it comes to this. So, for instance, the licenses and permits might not be transferable. You might not be able to actually just pick up a license or a permit and transfer it over to a different PTY LTT company. Another issue with buying assets only is that if you pick up all these assets, you move it to another company, it means that your bank accounts are now in a different company. It means you got to deal with all your contracts with your customers. So for instance, LawPath has um, a bunch of subscribers who are uh, paying a monthly fee or an annual fee for their use of the platform. Now, if LawPath wanted to sell its business, the question is, well, do they sell the assets or do they sell the shares in their business? Now, if they sold the assets, then they have an issue because they have a bunch of subscribers who are on an automatic renewal clause um, and on a monthly payment uh, scheme or an annual renewal. And if 
they were to just pick up all the assets and move it into a new buyer's company, then that means that they would probably need to get every single customer to re-sign brand new terms and conditions and to give up their new bank of details to a new third-party payment gateway um, and the bank account that those uh, payments are going into would also change. Um, and also all the customers who are signed up, they would need to be notified that the contract that they had with LawPath Operations Pty Ltd is no longer LawPath Operations Pty Ltd, but instead it's now LawPath version 2, which is the new company that's just acquired the assets. And the problem is, is that not all contracts allow you to simply assign over the rights obligations to somebody else. So the first thing to look at is if you're buying a business and they have contracts in place, then you want to make sure that those contracts have an assignment clause. And if they don't, you might be buying assets, but you might not be able to bring the customers along because you might not be able to convince the customers to sign a new contract with your business. Alternatively, if you're a gym, for instance, almost never will a gym be actually be buying out the share or the the assets of the of the gym. And the reason for that is that there's all these subscribers who have signed up for memberships who pay as a direct de debit into the bank or into the gym's bank account every week or every month, uh, a membership fee. Now, if a new gym was to come along and just buy the assets of the gym and move them over, then they're going to have to get all these members to now start paying into the new company's bank account and sign off on new direct debit authorities. But the problem is, is that all these people who don't actually attend the gym will then just simply stop paying and you'll lose all these memberships. So buying the assets is not always the best solution. And sometimes you go and buy the shares instead. And buying the shares causes the least amount of disruption possible to the actual business because normally no one actually knows that there's been a change of shareholding. And effectively what you do is when you buy the shares in a business, the existing directors resign, the new directors are appointed, all the shares are sold to the new buyer, and uh, and that's about it. It's a quite a simple process. The what's not simple though is that when you're buying the shares, you're taking on all of these hidden issues or liabilities that you might not be aware of. So you might. So if this company, if you bought the shares, didn't pay its tax, didn't pay its super, didn't pay its employees in accordance with the modern award, um, whatever it might be. There could be a million different things that have occurred in the past that you're not aware of when you're buying this business um, that could pop up later and actually hurt your business significantly. And so that's the risk that you take when you buy the shares, because when you buy the assets, you just simply say, I buy the assets, I leave all liabilities behind. And we don't really care what happened in the past because we're leaving them all behind in the old company and we're just taking um, any of the assets and moving forward, we get the benefit from those assets. Whereas if you're buying the shares in the company, you're taking the past liabilities and the future benefits of the assets as well. Now, a lot of times people will say, well, that's fine, but a buy and sell business will always say in the agreement that the buyer assumes all the risk and liability after completion and the seller bears all risk and liability prior to completion, which means that the buyer or the seller will normally say, we promise we haven't been sued. We promise we paid every all the employees in accordance with their uh, modern award. We promise that uh, we own all the intellectual property. We promise, we promise, we promise that there's, and we give all these warranties that there is nothing wrong. Now, the problem is, is that a warranty or an indemnity is sometimes not worth the paper it's written on. And the reason for that, if you can just imagine this, is that if you buy 
the assets from another business, then what happens is that you pay them the purchase price, the seller gets the purchase price, distributes it to whoever, the directors of the company, the shareholders of the company, the family trust that owns the shares in the company, distributes it right away, closes down the company. Now, when the buyer goes to sue the seller for breach of these indemnities, the seller doesn't exist anymore. There's nothing that you can actually enforce against because you paid the purchase price. That purchase price is no longer there anymore. And the company that you bought the assets off of is gone. Same thing goes if you buy shares. You buy shares off of all these shareholders. If they're companies, you pay the, the share price to these companies. The companies get the money distribute it to their shareholders, distributes it to the families, close down the business. Now their warranties are worth nothing. So if you are buying a business or buying shares, you always want to get a personal guarantee against the directors or the individuals who are behind that company so that if anything does happen, at the very least, you can sue that individual personally. And it does give a little bit more weight to the indemnity clauses that you might have in your agreement. Now, I've already gone through most of these, but going back to this again, so buying the assets, the benefit is that you can exclude certain things as well. So you can say, I'm going to take all the assets, I'm going to leave all behind all the liabilities, I'm going to uh, take all the assets, but you can keep your motor vehicle um, or, or whatever it is. There's no GST that applies because you're buying all the all the assets as a going concern. So if you were to say, for instance, I just want to pick and choose a couple of these assets, but not all of them, then there could be a GST issue because when you're buying a business, you got to buy that business with all of its assets so you can continue on uh, carrying on that business as a going concern. And if you don't and just say, I just want the intellectual property only, then there is a situation where GST might apply. apply. Now, the disadvantage to buying the assets, assets is that, um, well, as I mentioned, you, you've, got, uh, you've got this GST issue, but also you've got to, it, it causes a significant disruption potentially where you've got to get new contracts with your suppliers, your employees, your clients, and so on, new bank accounts. You don't have any of the historic financials of the business either. So, that's why buying shares is sometimes better. So for instance, if you bought a business that's been running for 10 years, you could buy that business. Um, so if you bought just the assets, you could buy it, but then you don't have a historic financials. So you're not going to be necessarily able to borrow money based on past financial results. Whereas if you buy the shares, it's the exact same entity. You can then show a bank, I've just bought this company. This is the past uh, turnover of this company. Here's the profit and loss for the last five years. And you can show that it has the capacity to repay a lender. Other advantages, no one normally needs to know. There are some supplier contracts like banks and things like that, which will have a change of control clause that you would need to notify certain people that there's been a change in shareholding. But oftentimes, you don't need to tell your customers. You don't need to tell your suppliers. Um, and everything just comes with it. The bank accounts come with it. The phone numbers come with it. The, the uh, domain names, the trademarks, everything. Whereas going back, if you buying the assets, you've got to log into ASIC and you've got to register the transfer the business name. You've got to log into your domain name, transfer the domain. You've got to contact your telecommunication companies, telling them that the phone numbers change, transfer the phone numbers, same with the electricity and so on. So there's a lot more work going into the sale of assets, but the benefit is that you leave the liabilities behind. Um, and then the disadvantage about buying the shares is, as I, I mentioned, is this disruption, but also you're taking on all past uh, liabilities and the only way to protect yourself is from warranties or an indemnity clause, which might not be worth what, worth the money that's written on. And so there is some risk there. Now, if we look at the process of starting to buy a business or even sell a business, 
The first step is you need to know what the value of the business is. The second step is before you start, let's say you're going to sell, before you start telling someone uh, what the financials are for your business, who your customers are, are, who your supplier is, let them look at the intellectual property you have and so on, you need to have some kind of confidentiality agreement in place. Normally, this is done by a heads of agreement, which is a high level um, document that effectively sets out the high level terms of what um, the agreement will be saying if you if they do buy it, or you do a non-disclosure agreement or confidentiality agreement. Uh, the second step is after you've signed off on a heads of agreement, there's normally a due diligence process. That's where you're gonna ask them to give, give you their profit and loss, the balance sheet, probably open up what we call a data room. So the data room is basically, it could be a, um, a Google Drive, it could be a Dropbox, it could be anything along those lines, um, which sets out normally in folders, the copy of the, you know, copy of the, the invoices for the different equipment, the employment contracts, the contractor agreements, the tax returns filed, the profit and loss, and it sets out all the different documents and it enables someone to go and do their due diligence. And once that has been um, completed and they're settled, then you go and prepare the contract to finalize it. Now, when we look at the valuation of the business, this is normally done by an accountant. Normally the accountant for the vendor, the seller has already valued it. And the um, accountant for the purchaser has assessed it and confirmed that they're comfortable with that. Now, when you look at the valuation, there's different ways you can do it. So if you're buying the assets, you can look at what the actual purchase price, less the depreciation on those assets are, or maybe they've appreciated alternatively. Um, you can look at the return on the investment saying, okay, well, the, uh, the profit year on year is $100,000. I'm happy to pay 300,000. I'll get my return within three times and within three years, and then I'll benefit from that. Um, another one is just looking at multiples. So generally a service business like a law firm or accounting firm can be somewhere only between two and three multiples of their actual turnover, not their profit, but their turnover. So if you make a million dollars a year, your business is worth about two to three million. Um, but if you're a tech startup, sometimes your multiple is a lot higher. So if you have an annualized reoccurring income, so like a subscription base where people continue on on a subscription and they don't have a churn, so they're not actually falling off and, and you're able to keep your subscription base, then there's a lot higher valuation given to technology companies that have annual reoccurring income based on subscription only. And that can be up to 11 times your annual income or more. So it depends on that. And then the other one is just comparing other businesses, um, seeing what the other businesses are selling for in the industry, see what, you know, look at the ASX uh, listed companies, see what their profit margin are on certain products, look at their turnover and so on. So there's different things, but you're going to need to get an accountant, or at least it's extremely highly recommended that you um that you fix your um that you fix your uh um or, or you get an accountant to deal with that now someone just identified that the slide says three times the annual net profit and so that's um yeah it, it depends it, you know it, it depends on every single industry so legal and accounting is based on revenue um you know if it's um if it's what was it? I just did recently? Um, if it was um, business coaching, it's profit based. So it, it really does depend on what the figures are going to end up looking at, what makes sense for, for an accountant and what makes sense to the buyer. So don't rely on anything I'm saying here in terms of valuations, because we're lawyers. We don't do the valuations at all. We exclude numbers completely from when we when we act, we do not give financial advice. Lawyers are prohibited from giving financial advice, so uh, you need to get a business advisor or accountant to make sure that the valuation is correct. And a lawyer will never tell you whether that's a good buy or not because we are not allowed to by law.
Now, if we look at what's going to be in the heads of agreement, so heads of agreement will normally say, okay, well, the sale price is to be agreed or the sale price is 100,000. Um, these are the assets that are going to be included. These are the stock that's going to be included, like the work in progress, um, the restraint of trade. So the, the, the shareholders of the seller are going to be restrained from operating competitive business. And you include that into there. Uh, you'd mention what the holding deposit is. You would say that the the buyer's liable for the legal costs of the seller in the event that the buyer doesn't go ahead with signing off on the final agreement. Um, and it would normally say that um, everything's confidential. And once the heads of agreement is signed off, the buyer has exclusivity and the seller is not allowed to approach or negotiate with anybody out else for this period of time while the buyer has the exclusive time to consider buying this business. Now, when we talk about disclosure, as I mentioned, this data room, <clears throat> there's various different things. You know, if I do due diligence, I have a 28 page due diligence report spreadsheet that I issue out, which is dealing with almost absolutely everything, but that's when you're dealing with multi-million dollar acquisitions, but that would include things like a copy of the constitution, shareholders agreement, evidence that everybody signed the shareholders agreement, all the past board minutes, all the uh, past board resolutions, shareholder resolutions, leases, amendment to leases, employment contracts, amendment to employment contracts, and you have different categories for everything. Um, and, and that's basically what you get the buyer or that's what you get the seller to uh, complete in their data room. But this is just an example of certain things that are normally the bare minimum of what you'd be looking for. Proof that the intellectual property is owned from them, um, a copy of any letter of demand that they've ever received about using their brand, have they ever infringed their brand, their, the intellectual property of somebody else, for instance. And based on these disclosure documents is also the basis of what your warranties and indemnities you're going to be looking for when you put in when you put your contract together uh, so that when you buy it and if you saw any discrepancies in these disclosure documents you're able to put warranties in the contract saying look you weren't able to prove that uh, you own your trademark you were you were able to prove that um, that you had someone from Fiverr um, prepare that logo for you but you don't have any contract with that uh, designer and you don't know where that design actually came from whether they stole it from somewhere else so we're just going to put a warranty in here that says that in the, the that you warrant that you own the intellectual property in this logo and that if there is any um, claim against um, the infringement of a third party's intellectual property when we use that logo then you're going to indemnify us from all loss and expenses incurred as a result of that Um, if we look at different issues that we have with the sale agreement, um, the common problems that we normally come up, come up with is, uh, is around how the, well, whether the deposit's refundable when it is refundable and whether it's allowed to be invested or not to be invested. A lot of times people will um, pay a deposit, do their due diligence after and find out it's riddled with problems and then they're fighting over getting the deposit back. Um, so you need to make sure it's very clear that that deposit is refundable if the due diligence fails and you'd want to have a definition of failing of the due diligence. Um, or you want that deposit to be refunded if you don't sign off on a final transaction document for whatever reason. So whatever it is, just be careful of the conditions that you are agreeing to regarding the deposit. Um, paying the purchase price. So sometimes, let's say for instance, you buy a law firm, we use this as an example, you're probably not operating a law firm, but just as a normal services business, uh, let's say that that law firm has a million dollars turnover. Now we know that most of the clients are going to that law firm because they're dealing with that lawyer that they've created that relationship with. So there's a big risk that if they buy that law firm and that lawyer leaves, then all the clients could leave as well 
maybe not to that lawyer that's left because there's a restraint to trade clause, but maybe they'll just go somewhere else. So in these circumstances, we have what's called an earnout. And an earnout says, okay, well, we've looked at your law firm. You looked at all the computers and lease and everything else. We'll give you $500,000 for the assets. And we'll give you the remaining $2 million by way of an earnout, which is as long as your this law firm is able to maintain a million dollar revenue for the next three years, we will pay you the purchase price in installments over those three years. So for instance, if um, if the client database fell by 10% or the revenue fell by 10%, then you wouldn't be hitting these certain KPIs. And as a result of not hitting these KPIs, further payments aren't due and payable. Um, so an earnout is basically KPI or targets that need to be met. And if those targets are not met, then the remaining purchase price is not paid. Uh, it also, having that earnout, puts a lot of pressure on the person that sells the business to make sure that they normally continue working in the business and don't go and start a competitive business, but also they work in the business and they make sure that all the goodwill is slowly passed on to the new owner to because it's in their interest to get their earnout paid. So it's in their interest to do everything they can to make sure that um, all the targets are met. And then, as I mentioned before, getting guarantees, not just from the person that's not just from the company that sold the shares or sold the assets, but from the directors who sit behind it or the directors of the shareholders that sit behind the business. Now, if we look at the um, asset sales, again, a lot of people don't know this, but if you were to buy just the business, so not the PTY LTD shares, not the shares, just the assets themselves, then what happens with the employees? So it might be a case that, that you say, okay, well, I'm not going to buy the shares in the company because I don't know whether they've actually paid their employees correctly in the past. So I'm just going to pay by the assets in the business. And then I will tell the, the seller to terminate all these employees, pay them out all their entitlements, and then I'll hire the employees um, new under a new contract under my new business. Um, and I won't be responsible for any of the past unpaid wages, unpaid super un, uh, tax withholding that wasn't withheld, things like that. But under section 311 of the Fair Work Act, it doesn't work that way. Under section 311 of the Fair Work Act, it says that anyone that buys a business and employs any employee from that business within three years of them buying, or three months from them buying it, assumes all uh, statutory entitlements and is liable for all statutory entitlements of those employees that were owned by the previous business. And so the only way for you to actually be fully uh, certain that you're not going to be liable for past annual leave, long service leave, uh, sick leave, uh, and other entitlements and underpayment of wages and uh, super payments is to get the, the seller to actually terminate the employees. They have to send them a letter terminating their employment. Um, they have to deal with any un, any kind of unfair dismissals. They've got to deal with any kind of redundancy pay and notice pay. They've then got to pay out each of those employees their annual leave entitlements and all the other entitlements that they might be owing. They then need to give you evidence that they have paid out all the past entitlements to these employees. And only then can you then come along and hire these employees and say, okay, well, um, we're going to hire you not as part of the business though. And you should be waiting three months as well past the statutory period under section 311 of the Fair Work Act. Otherwise, you're always going to be assuming a risk that you're taking on employees that have unpaid entitlements. And that's why you need to do your own due diligence when you're taking on uh, employees. Something else that you normally want to do is you want to adjust the contract price. So let's say you have 
um, you've reached an agreement that the con that the um, business is worth a million dollars, and then you look at and see that there's ten employees. And you can see some of them have been around for five years, some of them have been around for two, and they have accrued annual leave and accrued long service leave of twenty five thousand. Well, you're going to want to adjust that entitled those entitlements against the purchase price if you haven't got the previous employer or the seller to actually um, pay out all those entitlements before you take on the business. So that's just something that you need to be careful of employees and their entitlements and you be assuming liability for them um, simply by buying the business and having an indemnity clause isn't always going to be good enough. You want either to reduce your purchase price or proof that all those entitlements have already been paid out to the employees. Other things to consider, um, if you have a lease. So one of the things is when you assign over a lease, you need to have the landlord's consent. So if you don't have the landlord's consent, you could end up buying a business and having no premise to operate from. So imagine buying a restaurant, but having no lease to operate that restaurant, which means no kitchen, no nothing. And it happens because a landlord generally only has to consent to the assignment of a lease if the incoming tenant has the same or similar financial background and experience. Um, they got to act reasonably. And there's a whole slew of case law on that in itself. But to uh, solve and, and resolve any kind of nightmare, you want to make sure you get a landlord's consent to the assignment of the lease prior to you signing your sale agreement and committing yourself to buying the business and having the deed of assignment negotiated and agreed before you sign off on that sale agreement. And if you don't, then you need to have a condition precedent in your sale agreement that says that you don't pay the purchase price until the deed of assignment has been signed by the landlord and the landlord's consent to you coming into the new premise. Something else that's really important about a lease is when you take over a lease, you have what's called a make good provision. And on top of that, when you are, when you when the lease is assigned to you or your new business, you are filling in the shoes of the past tenant, which means that all the past liabilities of the past tenant become your liabilities. So if you buy a business off of someone that has a lease and you buy that business and you take over the lease, that landlord can now send you a letter of demand saying you failed to pay your rent for the past four months, even before you own the business, because you've now stepped into the shoes of the past tenant. So you need to make sure from the landlord that there's no breach, there's no past liabilities. And, and going back to the make good clause is that let's say you bought a restaurant or let's say you bought any business with a big, huge commercial fit out. At the end of the lease, almost always it says you've got to make good, meaning you've got to put this lease back into the exact same position as it was when it was first leased out. Now, you don't know what it looked like when it was first leased out because you've only come in now and took over the lease. So before you sign off on that lease, you need to make sure what it was compared to what it is now and understand what the cost to put it back into the bare bone basic shell is going to be. And sometimes that can be significant. That can be uh, redoing all the wiring, redoing all the plumbing, removing entire kitchens, light fixtures, painting, carpets, you name it. it, it sometimes I've seen it range from, from around five to around $100,000 in, in uh, costs. So just have consideration to that. Um, also, another adjustments that you normally have to the purchase price is if you're buying something that has stock, some consumables that are in and out, normally you do a, a stock take a day before the completion. So at 5 p.m. at the end of business, a day before completing, you do a stock take, you look at what the value of the stock is and you add that onto the purchase price. Or maybe sometimes we have the stock already valued at 100,000, for instance, and then you go in and, and deduct what's no longer there. Um, and then also adjustments is for utilities. So utilities are only paid every quarter. So you normally do an adjustment for what the utilities are 
um, and, and so on. So there's various different adjustments that take place when you take over a business. Uh, and also, for example, for um, instance, if you're taking over employees, well, who's you, you got to do an adjustment to who's responsible for paying half the month, for instance, of the wages and the other half of the month. So you got to call, draw a line in the sand and actually calculate who's responsible for what from the day of completion. Um, and then you normally have a handover clause that talks about making sure that the vendor or the seller is going to help you introduce you to key suppliers and things like that. Um, but there's a lot more things that get into this and there's a lot more complexities. So talking again about the um, buying the assets, you've got to do the, the business name transfers. You've got to get the logins to all the different accounts. You've got to change all the login accounts. You've got to get all the passwords and usernames to that phone, so on. Um, and uh, and then you also want to look at the CGT, so capital gains tax issues and GST issues. Sometimes you want to set the different uh, purchase price based on different things. So you might want to value the asset at something, but the goodwill at something else and the stock at something else. And this can help you reduce your tax. So it's important that your purchase price isn't just $100,000, but it's $50,000 for the assets, $21 for the goodwill, 20,000 for the work in progress, um, 30,000 for the um, stock or whatever it, or whatever is the case. So talk to your accountant again about pricing up that uh, value and how it's actually calculated because it could help you in the future if you ever have to sell your assets or sell your business or when it comes to capital gains tax or um, GST. And then buying the shares, um, you're basically just doing a share sale agreement and that's it. You're, you're buying all the shares, you're transferring them across, there's certain warranties. Um, if there's an existing shareholders agreement, you want that terminated. If there's an existing constitution, you want that terminated. And then you want to implement a new constitution. And if you're going into business with other shareholders who bought the business with you, you want to get a shareholders um, agreement in place. Generally speaking, there is no stamp duty that's applicable on a transfer of shares in New South Wales anyway. Uh, this was abolished many years ago. But if your company owns securities, so owns shares, or if it owns property, stamp duty could apply. So you might want to double check with your accountant whether stamp duty is going to be applicable if you're buying a company that has a portfolio of shares, for instance. Uh, and as I mentioned, you want to get a new constitution, new shareholders agreement, and a deed of accession is getting new incoming shareholders to be bound by an existing shareholders agreement. Um, and then, so what happens when it all goes pear-shaped? You really want to have really detailed clauses about a termination clause and breach clauses. So when someone breaches the warranties, so let's say the vendor says, um, there's no lawsuits. We paid all our employees in accordance with all the applicable laws. Um, we own all the intellectual property. And, um, and this is our true and accurate financial records. And then you buy the business and you find out that everything was cash in hand. The financials aren't correct. The employees are actually owed money. There's a workers' compensation claim against your business. And, uh, and a client just sued you for 50 grand for their money back for a product that they bought from you. What do you do? Well, the first step is to, before you, you, the first step is to make sure you have a really good detailed clause that deals with these breach of warranties. So a breach of warranty saying, I get my money back and you can take your business back normally doesn't work. Because once you've actually got ownership of the business, they're always going to have a defense that says, well, yes, you we breached a warranty, but that doesn't result in the entire purchase price going back to you. You've got to quantify what this breach of warranty is. So there needs to be a clause that deals with how do you put a value on the breach of warranty. And if you can't put a value on the breach of warranty, then how are you actually going to resolve it? 
uh, and it's normally by what's called an indemnity. So it's saying you've got to make good this breach of warranty, and if any loss or damage we sustain as a result of it, they've got to the, the seller's got to pay for that. Um, they've also maybe have to defend the legal proceedings. So it might be the case that they have to fund lawyer costs to defend it. Um, but have a look at the termination clauses, have a look at the breach clauses and make sure you're happy with what those clauses say. Because simply saying, um, if there's a breach of warranty, then we'll give the business back to you and you give us the purchase price back. That's never gonna work. And I wouldn't be agreeing to that because practically it's it does not work. So it should normally be a damages claim, which is money. Um, and now in, in here, we talk about a rescission clause and a rescission clause is basically saying everything's void, we reverse it back. You're never gonna find out that there's a breach of a warranty in the first week, two weeks, three weeks, five weeks. It's gonna come down later down the line. Um, so it's not in anyone's interest to have that rescission clause. So have a look at it. It's probably not a good idea uh, instead to have damages clause that deals with damages. If you want to rescind the contract and reverse everything back, you can always negotiate a deal by doing that um, outside of the actual contract terms. Uh, and that's about it. I'll get to the Q&A, but first we will get Ryan back on and, um, and then I'll be back in two minutes. Thank you, Damon. Great presentation. And as you can see, there's a lot to consider when you're buying or selling a business. So from some survey results we've done, we do find around 80% of individuals and 87% of small to medium businesses find it difficult to access legal services. Uh, generally, they think it, it's out of reach or it can be expensive or can be complicated, which is not the case at all with the Law Path platform. So you can access legal consultations uh, contract management here on the left-hand side. Uh, so things around uh, deed of accession, business sale agreement, term sheet for the sale of a business. There's plenty of customizable documents for exactly what we're talking about. There's workflows on if you're looking to hire employees, bring a contractor on board, set up a family trust, uh, all the related things coming along with that. And then booking in legal consultations. So speaking to a lawyer, uh, to make sure you're on the right track and reviewing some documents as well. So just in terms of the documents library, as you can see here, this is a sample of a, a business sale agreement. As you can see, this is a free one-page sample that all LawPath customers can take a look at, and it does present uh, what the actual agreement is for. And then obviously the sub clauses there. So you can see a lot of the things that Damon has mentioned, they're covered in there and they can be customized for your specific business. So for everyone on the presentation today, we have the legal advice plan going for 30% off. What you're receiving here is unlimited 30 minute calls with our lawyers. You're receiving unlimited verbal document review. So all of these agreements around business sale, we can get reviewed for you as well as employment and HR support. We can go through our live chat with lawyers for quick answers. We also have a legal marketplace if you do require some contract drafting or more sophisticated manner. Uh, we have LawPath AI, which can answer and do basic contract drafting, which is only improving with time. So again, to get that tailored legal support, especially when you're buying and selling a business, there's a lot to consider and you don't want to get it wrong as the consequences can be quite dire. If you do want to take advantage of this special offer on the screen, please key yes into the chat below. It's a phenomenal deal at $84 a month, which is paid annually for the full year at $1,000. And eight dollars. Now, LawPath will be doing a price increase come first of November, where these prices will be increasing, and this deal will no longer be available. So, if you'd like to take advantage of the special, please key yes into the chat. I'd love to get on board with you this afternoon, have a chat, even walk you through uh, the LawPath platform if you're currently a Essentials or a Virtual Office subscriber.